Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the Korean Peninsula. This episode was produced in cooperation and with the support of the East Asian Study Center at The Ohio State University. One source of the success of K-pop idols and groups in Korea as well as abroad can be found in their exceptionally active and dedicated fans. For many of them, being a fan goes beyond just listening to their idols' music. It also means buying and collecting merchandise, attending fan events and live recordings, or even translating appearances of their idols for global fans. These are costly endeavors, both in terms of money and time. Yet they have become a hallmark of K-pop's fan culture. To learn more about the relationship between K-pop idols and their fans, we spoke to Dr. Stephanie Choi. She told us about how fans act as both promoters as well as regulators of their idols' activities, and about the role that intimacy plays in this relationship. We also discussed the origins of fan groups in Korea and their evolution over the decades, the kinds of labor fans engage in to ensure the success of their idol, the rules dictating fans' idol interactions, and the services that idols provide in return to their fans. Stephanie Choi is adjunct assistant professor in East Asian Studies at New York University. She earned her PhD in ethnomusicology from the University of California, Santa Barbara. She also holds an MA in ethnomusicology from Wesleyan University and a degree in Korean music from Seoul National University. Interviews with Stephanie Choi have been featured in The New Yorker, NBC News, The Korea Herald and The Korea Times, among others. Dr. Stephanie Choi, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you for inviting me. Today's interview will be focusing on the relationship that exists between K-pop idols and their fans. First of all, what got you interested in this topic? I was a Kayakum performer. It's a 12-string zither for more than 10 years. And then I joined the master's program in ethnomusicology at Wesleyan University. That was already back in 2009. And my American friends, after they realized that I was from Korea, they started to ask me if I knew Girls' Generation and Big Bang. And back then I thought K-pop idol music was for teenagers. So I, I told them, you know, like, I don't follow idol groups anymore. But I got really interested in the phenomenon of how non-Asian American fans following Korean idol groups. So... Um, I thought it would be interesting to study the K-pop phenomenon in America when I proceed my study in PhD. Do you consider yourself a fan? Do you have a favorite group? And if so, whom? I follow multiple um, K-pop groups, but my favorite would be EXO and BTS and SHINee. Early on in your dissertation, you used the word ACA fan. Uh, Can you tell us more about that? ACA fan is a combination of academic fan. Henry Jenkins, who's a famous fandom scholar, argued that fans who are often pathologized by academics, meaning that academics have considered fans as deviant and abnormal compared to the general audience. And he, he started to argue that scholars themselves should become fans and join the participant observation, which is the major ethnographic methodology. That's how the, the term ACA fan developed. A central theme of your research is intimacy and transactions of intimacy in K-pop. What do you mean by that? So when I was studying K-pop, I realized that there was something more important than music, mainly because fans were working so hard By working, I mean always stream their music, buy multiple albums. They always follow their performances, events, concerts, not just for themselves, but also for the idol's publicity and popularity. And I realized that all of their fan activities revolve around the idols, um, not just the music. I also saw fans sometimes boycotting their own favorite idols, which was very new to me. So I looked at what kind of what kind of interactions are going on in terms of the business. And I um, came to conclude that there is 
an effort from the fan side to valorize intimacy as a transacting commodity between them and the company and idols. Is this unique to K-pop? Can we see something similar in relation to other fandoms uh, with non-Korean artists, superstars like Taylor Swift or Justin Bieber or Beyonce? This is definitely not unique to K-pop. To some degree, um, you'll also see similar things happening with Western artists. Justin Bieber, for example, when he comes out of the stage, he lets his fans kiss on his cheek. He allows that, understanding that this is his fans, it's not just total strangers. Taylor Swift also sells tickets that combines VIP seats with fan meets. The more you pay, the more access you get to your celebrity. Um, You also see some hip-hop artists getting boycotted by his fans when they make misogynist uh, remarks. So intimacy between the celebrity and fans is not unique to K-pop. I would say that it's a fundamental of the celebrity culture. Additionally, you use the term fanhood rather than fandom. Why is that? The difference I wanted to point out was that fandom refers to the phenomenon. So there's no agency of fans the autonomy or the the power or will of fans to act. Fanhood, I wanted to stress that fans act and make difference in their own world. So that would be the difference. The early 1990s is often described as the early days of K-pop. Is that when fan clubs first appeared? Is it possible to tell what was the first fan club in Korea? Actually, the first fan club in Korea uh, appeared in the mid-1960s. It was high school girls who followed British entertainer Cliff Richard. They just gathered at a coffee shop or a palace, that's they said, to give a good impression to the adults. And they always wore school uniforms when they met, and they just shared new information about the store. They had their own fan club activities, making fan-made merchandise and, you know, um, selling them to other fans and then donating to Civic Center. They also found out that there was a Cliff Richards Japan tour in 1969. So they persuaded the newspaper company to invite him. So they made Cliff Richard come to Korea and I think he performed for three days. So they were able to meet their own star through this group effort. So yeah, the first fan club was was formed in the mid-1960s. How has the relationship between idols and fans changed since then? I think fans' organization skills and group activities remain the same. The difference occurred only by the mid-2000s when the cable companies started to incorporate fan management into the company. There were no longer um, fan club executives who were also fans of the star, but the company staff started to manage the fan club. Is it possible to identify eras when it comes to the evolution of fan clubs? So up until the early 2000s, fan clubs were voluntarily run by fans themselves, and the fan club executives were mostly fans. So they would receive information, important information, such as the celebrities' schedules, and then they would distribute the information to the rest of the fans. So there was a hierarchy between fans because the fan club executives were also fans who were quite privileged to meet their own stars and and meet the company staff. After the early 2000s, the K-pop companies start to incorporate the fan club management into the company, meaning that the company staff started to manage the fan club meaning that there was no longer a hierarchy between fans 
and it really depends on your economic investment. So the more you pay, the more access you can get to get closer to your star. It has nothing to do with you becoming a fan club executive to meet your idol. A couple of months ago, you argued in a symposium by the New Yorker that fans buy intimacy and that this money comes with very specific expectations. How much of a driver is money in today's fandom? I think intimacy as a commodity has been always important in the celebrity culture. I think that's the basic of the celebrity culture. The unique characteristic of K-pop is that fans started to valorize it as a commodity of their business. They started to realize and inform the company that this is the main product that we wish to trade. One of the first instances where fans boycotted their own idols or fans requesting a feedback from their idols was when the BTS fans requested BTS and their company to basically apologize for their past misogynist remarks and lyrics. That lasted for several months, and eventually um, these fans were able to interview with major newspaper in Korea, and right after that, they hit entertainment and BTS apologized for their misogynist remarks and lyrics and informed that they are still growing and they will improve in terms of what they should do and they shouldn't do. Since then, it has become very common for K-pop bands to request a feedback or even boycott their own idols when they feel like something is not working on in the way they want. And it was really interesting when they boycotted their own favorite idol, especially because of a dating scandal. The reason was really interesting because they were pointing out several elements and said, this idol, thus, is not professional. So they, were, they started to uh, mention professionalism and started to incorporate this pseudo-lover relationship between the idol and themselves. So they were making this pseudo-lover relationship official that this is our play. This is the main thing that K-pop idols should perform. Before then, the mass media, the public, and academics would consider fans, especially fangirls, deviant or abnormal or irrational, uh, looking at fangirls playing over this pseudo-lover relationship with their celebrities. But now you see how K-pop female fans making that official and telling the world that we know what we are doing and this is part of the game and this is a business where the company and the idols should also be aware of what they're doing and this is what we request them to do. And if this is not well performed, then you're considered unprofessional. So that way they were justifying their, their boycott against their idol's dating relationship. Do you have specific examples? I'm reluctant to talk about it because I'm, I'm afraid I would upset any uh, fandom. But most recently, the most famous one would be Exo Chen's uh, marriage. Fans claimed that they already knew his dating relationship and fans were trying to hide that for the brand of EXO so that EXO could remain its popularity, current popularity. But after Chen announced his marriage, fans are claiming that Chen harmed EXO's reputation by getting married. They also argue that new plans for the group were canceled because of this announcement, which is not confirmed, but fans believe that such things happened inside the company. So all these private matters are linked to their group activities and public activities. So fans are claiming that after all, the celebrity's private life cannot be solely private. 
Idol's success seems highly contingent on the support of their fan base beyond just simply buying the Idol's music, as you mentioned. What kind of activities, or you use the term labor, do fans engage in on a regular basis? Fans have their own roles as promoters and marketers. Some fans stream the music all the time. Some fans follow the idol schedules and take photos, upload them on online. Some fans collect money from other fans and make donations. Some fans also buy multiple albums. Some fans promote the idols through posters and billboards. Is there a, a typical fan today, for example, in terms of gender or age or socioeconomic background? It's really hard to pinpoint specific gender or age, but in general, especially in Korea, the one who has the biggest power and voice in the fandom will be female fans in their 20s and 30s. I also see that female fans are more visible in the global fandom as well. I often see how male fans are often celebrated because they don't really make voices or, or appearance in the fandom. Do you have any idea why that is the case? Why male fans don't seem to have as big of a presence? According to my interview with male fans, male fans were having a hardship in terms of how they are viewed by their family and friends. So one of my interviewees said chasing after girl groups is not cool. His friends would say, let's go watch baseball. Why would you go after girl groups? You're already 23. Fan activities are often considered feminized something that is emasculated. So it seemed like even if they do the same fan activities, they didn't want to reveal themselves or conduct any kind of group activities because it's socially it's not considered cool. How much of a driver is money in today's fandom? Is it the single most important factor deciding whether you can have access to intimacy? Or are there alternative pathways to intimacy? I think it doesn't matter if you are going to enjoy your fan activity as an individual. You can feel intimate to your idol as much as you want. But when you join the fan activity as a group, then it makes a great difference. Let's say you, you joined SM Entertainment's bubble. It's basically a chat room where it looks like you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with your idol. But in fact, all of these um, fans who paid for the content can join the chat room and the idol would see millions of fan messages. But for you, it feels like you're having an intimate moment with your idol. And because it's a paid content, sometimes idols ask you not to distribute this information but he tells you you know this happened that happened and he also uploads photos of himself telling you know do not leak this photo now you have to make the promise as a group if one single fan leaks this photo then you know that promise is no longer valid so you have to consider yourself as part of the group in terms of the access, I think Korean fans are more sensitive to how much you pay for what you get because you actually can get access to the idols if you pay more. You can go to the concert, you can go to these music shows. The more effort you put into the process, the more access you can get. But for foreign fans, I found out that even if they pay more, you know, it remains the same. Unless you, you go on this app or in digital media, you, you still can't get physical access to the idols. So I found out that this rule doesn't really work well with foreign fans. But interestingly, I also found out that foreign fans who come to Korea and live there and join this domestic fan activities, they start changing their mindset, just like Korean fans. So, so they become Koreanized in their fanness? I wouldn't use the term Koreanized, though, because it's 
sounds like it's a characteristics of Koreans, but I would say it's a characteristics of who actually gets the opportunity of getting physical access to the celebrity. It seems like fans spend a lot of time and a lot of money on these idols, and in return, they get intimacy. Is that rational? It's an illusion, right? You feel you're having a one-to-one conversation with your idol, but it's millions to one. When you think of a nation as an imagined community, isn't that also an illusion? What I'm saying is that if you enjoy this pseudo-lover relationship without realizing that this is a pseudo-lover relationship, and also on an individual level, that's how academics consider as abnormal and deviant and irrational. But if you are very much aware of what you're doing, and if you know that this is part of the game, and if you know how to enjoy the rule of the game with other fans, and even tell the idol to join the game, then that makes a great difference. So when the Bubble app first came out, I still remember Exo Baekhyun was writing on the chat room saying, you guys and everyone. And these fans started to tell Baekhyun, like, who's everyone? You know, who's, who's you guys? It's just you and me. So they were kind of giving him a sense of how this chat room works. So they know what's going on and they know how to play the game. And they are now telling the rules of the game to back to the idol so that they could enjoy this play. So they're not into this illusion, but they're, I, I would say they're rather using this illusion for their entertainment. What are the rules of the games for idols, so to speak? What are the things they can do? What are the things they should never do? In terms of male idols and female fans, for instance, it is based on the heterosexual relationship of a boyfriend and a girlfriend. Fans these days are very realistic. They know that these handsome young men will eventually be in a dating relationship without letting them know. Female fans say, yes, you can date someone. But since you join this idol industry and make money through our efforts, through our labor, you should at least try to hide this relationship. So that's part of his professional work, to try to hide the relationship and act as if fans are the number one partner in this business. Also, they are not supposed to satisfy fans' standard of ideal idol. They're not supposed to commit any kind of crime and misogyny, misogynistic behaviors. Sunri would be the most representative case. You're not supposed to engage in any kind of prostitution. You're not supposed to treat women like objects. You're not supposed to make any kind of uh, misogynistic remarks. Even if you have a girlfriend, you're not supposed to cheat on your girlfriend. I'm referring to Exo Chanyeol. And again, this kind of standards are pretty much popular among Korean fans, I think. Foreign fans are more generous about it. And this has also a specific context in Korea because especially after 2015, there has been a constant feminist movement among young women in their teens, 20s, and 30s. So this has become part of the fan activities in K-pop. Is there any example of, of an idol who succeeded at maintaining the illusion of pseudo romance for any duration of time and then got married without a fan backlash. So I have mentioned that the dating relationship is part of their professionalism. And if you look at Changmin at TVXQ, after 16, 17 years, I guess, after a dozen of years, he had maintained his career at the fullest and fans acknowledged that he worked hard So his marriage announcement was the very first time for him to reveal his dating relationship. So fans very much appreciated that and they thought, 
yeah, like we acknowledge that you worked hard, and this is about time for you to have your own private happiness. So we congratulate you to the fullest. So yes, there are definitely、uh, moments when fans acknowledge their dating relationship.、Um, I think it's really based on、uh, how much the idol worked hard for the group. So if a dating scandal happens in the first or second year of after their debut, that's a big deal because that's about time when they should work hard. But after ten years, I guess you know that's that's already a long time, and fans would think that they have went through all the struggles together and spent enough time to make a success. So they would understand that okay, this is about time for you to pursue your own happiness. You mentioned that feminism, to some extent, is a big part of fandom and the fanness of female fans towards male idols. How does that manifest in their activities, and how does that impact, let's say, gender relations between female fans and male idols? So compared to hip hop artists, for instance, K-pop male idols are very much willing to accept requests from his fans to remove any kind of lyrics that are misogynistic or sexually objectify women. Vix Ravi has released an album that includes a song that reminds of the girl group Red Velvet in a sexualized way. And of course, Red Velvet's fans were upset and requested feedback. And just within a day, he apologized and announced that he will recall all the previous versions and release a new version of it without the song. There are also fans who boycott their own idols when they make some kind of misogynistic remarks or behaviors. Big Bang Theory and Jung Jun Young's fans, Korean fans, boycotted against their own singers. In the relationship between an idol and his fans, is it fair to say that the male idol is often subordinate to the female fans? And if so, how does that play out, considering that Korean society remains quite patriarchal? I would say the mass media is one of the most. Progressive field compared to, let's say, the government or academia. You know, so if you follow the money, you can rather be progressive. I would say that also means female fans are the most powerful consumer group in K-pop. In your work, you talk about hegemonic femininity. Can you tell us more about that? I mentioned hegemonic femininity mainly because the Korean society in general is heteropatriarchal, but only within the K-pop world, female fans try hard to make it misogyny-free. Not only misogyny-free, but you will see how male idols are targeting adult female fans by infantilizing themselves. For instance, they never grow beard. They always shave their legs. During their early career, they don't make muscular bodies to look like teenage boys, even if they are over eighteen. They never show their fans smoking or drinking. They try to look young, not to fulfill pedophilic <laughs> taste. But rather to show their subordination to their female fans, so you'll see how the idols always—not、um, always, but you'll see how female fans who are teenagers talk casually to the idols. And this doesn't mean that they are rude, but it rather shows the hierarchy between. The male idols and female fans, and it also shows the consumer power of female fans in their twenties and thirties. So they set the standard of female fans, not the teenagers. In terms of the numbers, there may be much more、uh, teenage fans, but you'll see how the company consider the adult fans in their twenties and thirties who actually spend money. On the idols, so Nuna fans are important in K-pop. 
how do Korean male idols respond to these expectations? Are they fine with it? Do they feel conflicted about it? For example, they are expected to wear some kind of makeup. Is that just fine? Or is that something that they wrestle with? I think they resisted in the second generation. I still remember a Big Bang top. He, he drew eyeliner, and when one of the television hosts asked him whether he put makeup, he said, oh, I just have dark circles. BTS RM also um, talked about how he is reluctant to put makeup, and that was already in his early career. That was around 2013s when they start having more um, stronger makeup. But nowadays, I think it has become pretty much a norm in K-pop. And conventionally, makeup is considered to be something that is for females. But if you look at the way K-pop male idols put makeup, it is often about how they present their masculinity. It's not about how to look more feminine. Sometimes they put makeup to look even more masculine. So I think even the makeup setting is grounded in the heterosexual relationship between male idols and female fans. I'm not saying that there is no LGBT fans, but I think the companies are uh, still primarily targeting heterosexual female fans for their male idols. Reading your work, it seems that fan fiction and specifically homosexual relations between members from the same group, male members from the same group, is pretty common. How does that fit into this dynamic if the target audience, so to speak, are women in their 20s and 30s? I think that's why fanfic still remains underground. It's never commercialized. I mean, it is commercialized by fans selling their own fiction to other fans, but it's never corporatized. And what I found out was that it is, again, related to the access problem. So if you can get more access, you just go to the concert or you just go to the music show and meet the idol. You don't necessarily have to read fanfic. In Korea, it looks like there are more teenage fans who read and write fanfics. Outside of Korea, the range of age becomes wider. I met a lot of adult fans who enjoy writing and reading fanfics. So I would say that this is an issue of access. The more you get access to the idol, the less need you feel to read fanfic and the less space you get to have imagination over the idol's sexuality. But if you have less access to the idols, you can have much more space for your own imagination over the idol's sexuality and his characteristics. Many of these fanfics seem to represent homosexual relations. Is it just to the benefit of gay and or lesbian fans? There are definitely LGBT fan writers who write fanfics, but it is said that the majority of readers and writers are heterosexual female fans. The logic is that you want to make a safe space for you to enjoy idols only as the fictional characters in your story. Fans argue that this is not about men or women. We just don't want someone outside of the group. And that happens to look like two gay men falling in love. But it's just that within the group, there are only men. So the characters happens to be two males because they only want the group members to be in the story. But it doesn't necessarily link to their interest in gay masculinity. Yes, the majority of fanfics focus on sexual activities or homoerotic activities of these two men. And some LGBT fans try to make their own stories by adding uh, more of their realistic concerns and, and experiences as sexual minorities in their stories. So there are all these dynamics going on within the world of fanfic where heterosexual female fans 
making their own imaginative stories with the two men and LGBT fans also trying to put their own experiences in their story. How do idols respond to these fan fictions? By now, I think they understand that this is part of the culture. And I think they use it to tease the fans sometimes by letting fans that they are aware of it and fans would freak out because this should remain underground and they really don't want their idols to know that they're writing things about, you know, things like this. But I've seen some video clips of idols reading their fanfic or talking about their fanfic and fans under the comment would, you know, freak out saying, you know, oh my God, they're reading something that they shouldn't read. And they're like, I'm so embarrassed that they know about what we're doing, you know? So they're aware and willing to play along at times. Yeah, I think they already know that this culture exists and they're just trying to understand this as another form of play among fans. In this dynamic of transacted intimacy, are there cases where fans try to go beyond the fantasy and try to achieve real intimacy to actually meet their idols? Yes, and they are called Saseng. Saseng comes from the term Saseng uh, which means privacy. Sasengs are basically fans or stalkers who follow the idol's private schedules. So they go to the idol's dorm or house, wait until he comes out, or they even try to get into the house, which is quite scary, and follow wherever he goes and tries to find out what kind of people the idol is meeting what kind of activities he does, and sometimes take photos. Or There are a group of sasang who move all together, so they would share the information together. They sometimes hack the idol's phone and figure out what kind of conversation he's having with family or friends, or they find out his phone number and call him when he's on a live broadcast with other fans. So they are called Sasang and fans do not consider Sasang as fans. Sasangs are the ones who do not realize that this is part of the business and this is part of the game. They just consider this as the reality that they just, you know, do not follow any kind of fandom rules or, or the distance between the idol and fans and just, you know, tries to pursue whatever they want. Is it fair to say that fans, so to speak, are self-regulating? There are expectations regarding what it means to be a good fan, what you should do, what you shouldn't do? Yeah, definitely. Fans should act only as a group, not as an individual. So if you want to get access to the idol, it should always go through the official schedules of the idols. It should always proceed it as a group. So for instance, you want to meet BTS you should join an event um, held by the company and you should join it as an army, not as a random individual, right? So you get a permission, an invitation from the company by paying for the ticket. Then you can go there with other armies. That's the legal way and acceptable way for you to meet BTS. If you try to meet BTS just by you know, breaking into their house, that would not be okay. Once fans find out who this person is, they will share the information and she will no longer remain in this fandom. Yeah, they would basically accuse the person for not being a true fan. These rules are fairly restrictive. Did this impact your ability to conduct research and to interview idols for your research? Female fans are sensitive to whoever that is female getting access to their male idols. So when I met male idols, the first question they asked was whether I was a man or a woman, because that made a difference of when we should meet and where we should meet. When they found out I was a woman, 
they wanted to meet at two a.m. at a twenty-four-seven coffee shop. I remember how one of the idols I met wanted to have a seat at a table that was far from the window, so that he doesn't have to be anxious about whether、um, he will be seen by any female fans who pass by. So yes, they were very sensitive about. Meeting a woman, but this also happened mainly because we didn't get permission from their companies. It would have been different if I was, let's say, I was a reporter from a television show, and get an arrangement by companies. Then it would be drastically different. But I met them through my personal contact, and we didn't get permission from the companies, so we. Had to be very cautious of where to meet and when to meet. What would have been different if you had conducted the interview through the agency? Then maybe they might have invited me to the company building, which is a safe space for both of us, and even fans would understand that oh, this is part of his official schedule. It's not like his personal time spending with a random woman. So far, we've looked mostly at the relation between fans and idols, but clearly, companies seem to play a very big part in this relationship. What are the characteristics of, let's say, the perfect idol trainee for a regular entertainment company? So, I think the biggest difference between the Korean and Western music industry is that in the Western music industry, musical talent is something that is given. That is something that only genius people can get. But in the K-pop industry, the companies believe that anyone who works hard can acquire musical talent. When they recruit trainees, they care more about the appearance because yes, you can go through cosmetic surgeries, but there are always、uh, limitations, and you don't want to risk their lives on. Cosmetic surgeries, so、uh, they would take into consideration their appearance first, and then during the traineeship, they look at whether the trainee works hard and also build good friendship with other trainees, because after all, they will have a business partnership for more than ten years. Then you want to have someone who's in a good relationship with others. Also, you want to have someone who doesn't get you into trouble as a business partner. In Korean, it is called insong. I would say it can be translated as sincerity, humility, any kind of personal character that links to the sincerity. I would say sincerity to one's personal network and work, and they also care about the trainees. In Korean, it is called ki, which includes all kind of aura and flirting skills, some kind of power that draws people, people's eyes. So you need ki to become an idol. Music and dance need to be developed if you work hard. They have this monthly exam to test their development in music and dance. But if you do not Get better enough. They think you didn't work hard, rather than you have no skills in music and dance. How do companies approach this transaction of intimacy? Is it something they tolerate? Something they promoted in the first place? How do they fit in that story? I think the setting is definitely set up by the companies. But if you look at the way the intimacy is transacted between the idols and fans. It's really up to the personalities of the idols and fans. So some idols and fans play like best buddies. Some idols and fans play like lovers. Some idols and fans play like a jaded old couple. I would say when you try to join a fandom, you not only look at the idols, but a lot of people also look at the personality of the fan club. So the company is setting up the whole setting. Let's say SM Entertainment made this chat room called Bubble, but it really depends on the idol and fans who make the color of the chemistry. 
Could you give us a few examples of those moves or those colors that different fan clubs have? For instance, I joined, I paid for the bubble chat room for Shiny Key and Shiny Temin. And he sent lots of the, the little things in his daily life. And I felt more like a friend texting me. But Temin was really pushing this pseudo lover relationship he was sending you know lots of sweet messages and you know saying like i miss you like when can we meet you know like i hate covid you know like i miss you so much and i could feel how the atmosphere was so different even if they are from the same group you know based on his personality your interaction with the idol really differs in the case of Baekhyun, you also see how fans are directing Baekhyun to how to interact with them. Like when he says everyone, like fans would respond, you know, who's everyone? It's just you and me in this chat room, things like that. But then that again becomes a play when they upload that kind of episode on Twitter and say, you know, I told him this. And then like other fans would retweet that and, you know, make jokes about it then that becomes another way of cultivating intimacy between Baekhyun and them and also among them uh, that, you know, we feel the same. We're, we're teasing Baekhyun. That's also how um, fans direct the idols, how to interact with them. Over the years, there have been numerous stories of abuse and exploitation in the industry. How have fans reacted to this? So there are two... Two stories when it comes to the abuse. One is physical assault. The other is about their insanely hectic schedule. In terms of physical assault, it is considered as abuse. So when fans find it out, they would protest against the company and get an apology from the company and make sure that this will not happen. But when it is about the hectic schedule, fans always say that this schedule is insane. You know, like they really need to sleep and eat well. But when I talk to the idols, they rather talked about the idol system itself, about the industrial system, that even though fans say like you should take a rest, what will happen if they actually take a rest and do not appear for a month? They clearly know that fans wouldn't wait for them, but will move on to another group. So it's the nature of the idol industry that is really fast paced. There are all also so many idols waiting for your attention. So there's no choice, even for the companies, uh, when it comes to the hectic schedule. And I also found out that idols actually appreciate when the companies bring more and more scheduled events for them because that means the companies care about their career. So I think that's the problem of the industrial system, not about the abuse performed by the companies. And also with the restrictions in their private lives, that is again linked to the transacted intimacy, which is the essential part of the K-pop business. So again, that's also tied with the system. It's not just about some random company abusing their idols, but it's more about the fundamentals of the K-pop business. Does the government do anything to try to intervene? They give the minimum guideline over how much the minor entertainers should work. But once they become adults, then they no longer intervene. And there are also um, guidelines for the contracts, trainee contracts and idol contracts, so that they do not fall into an unequal contract. But other than that, once the contract starts, then it's really up to the company and the idols. Are there any cases where companies and fans clash over specific issues a few years ago, BTS's company, Big Hit Entertainment, announced a collaboration between BTS and Akimoto Yasushi, who's the producer of Japanese girl group AKB48. 
Korean fans started the online protest right away, claiming that Akimoto Yasushi is a pro-imperialist and misogynist based on his past activities, and they were very sensitive with pro-imperialist activities because Korea was once colonized by Japan, and a lot of issues during the colonial era has not been resolved until now. Some foreign fans also um, mentioned that this is really up to you two between Korean fans and, and the company. And Korean fans eventually moved to the official fan club website where they could have a closed communication with the company. And as far as I checked, they uploaded more than 14,000 posts that opposed the collaboration. And after three days, the company eventually canceled the collaboration. You just mentioned international fans. Do international fans and Korean fans belong to the same bubble? Or can we still see differences between two communities that at times will be at odd? I still see how their opinions are different when something happens. In general, I find that Korean fans are more sensitive with misogynist issues, primarily due to the current feminist movement in Korea. I also see foreign fans being more sensitive to racist issues, mainly because Korea was never colonized by the West, and the racial system, hierarchy, and racial discrimination is very new to Koreans, so they still have difficulties understanding the racial history outside of Korea. So far, it was okay for the companies to ignore the boycotting activities by foreign fans, but I think after BTS gained more spotlight from the American mass media, I think they should be much more aware of, especially of American racial history and system. At the start of this interview, we spoke about the past of K-pop fandom, To conclude, we'd like to ask you where you think it is going. Do you see changes on the horizon? I think there will be constant cultural mistranslations between Korea and the rest of the world. I particularly see how Korean companies are trying to be assimilated into the American racial system by depicting themselves as racial minorities, which is not, especially when the singers are native Koreans. Of course, there are Korean American and Asian American K-pop singers, but even when the singers are native Koreans, I still see how the companies are marketing the idols as racial minorities in the United States because that appeals more to the racial minorities as a fan base in the U.S., And I also see the resistance from the native Korean fans who refuses to become under the American hegemony within the global K-pop business. So I think there will be more and more cultural mistranslations and cultural misunderstandings and understandings between Korea and the rest of the world. But There are also active fans, including scholars like me, perform as cultural mediators. There's a very interesting project done by BTS fans called the White Paper Project. That was an effort to give a full overview of how BTS member Jimin Basically, Jimin wore a t-shirt that had a a picture of atomic bomb in Nagasaki and with words like independence, patriotism, basically celebrating the independence of Korea from Japan. And there were lots of conflicts between Korean fans, foreign fans, and also the the Guardian also um, released a news article with a statement from a rabbi in LA stating that BTS should apologize for the Holocaust and Japan victims. And it became an international issue between Korean fans who were claiming that the t-shirt was basically about the independence of Korea, not about the victims in Japan, versus fans who 
knew more about the Western-oriented history uh, where the U.S. had a guilt over the victims of atomic bomb. So the White Paper Project was basically explaining where Korean fans were coming from. And interestingly, the participants were basically from everywhere. They were, they were not just Koreans. I found it really interesting about how fans are constantly going through all these mistranslations, misunderstandings, but then also negotiations and also an effort to develop and, and cultivate cultural understandings between different cultures. Yeah, I think it'll still be dynamic and also fun to join the fandom. Dr. Choi, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episodes, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or with any podcast app, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. For more information and our archive with all previously released episodes, please visit our website.